This is the first Sunday of Advent. I had, hadn't really planned to speak on hope because of that. I just, I kind of I spoke a couple of Sundays ago on the, you better hope in a better hope. And I was thinking then, I should have saved that for, for uh, first Sunday of Advent. But uh, there were so many things I left out of that that I kind of get to fill those in today, I guess. But I it just seemed to come together anyhow. Maybe next Sunday we'll look at peace, which is the second Sunday of Advent theme usually, but not sure. But, uh, but there is this uh, concept of hope that we better hope in a better hope, something better than just what we would visualize. Uh, this, if, if I could produce something by my hope, this is what it would be in terms of things and circumstances and all that. Uh, hope, what I'm going to say today, hope, the message would be hope is personal, personal. It's based on a person, Jesus, not based on products, circumstances, situations. We all have hopes for things in our lives, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. If we didn't have hope, we'd be something wrong with us. Hope is a character quality uh, that, uh, you know, now abide faith, hope, and love. Three things that are con- going to continue on into eternity. We're still going to be hoping. Even in eternity, there are things yet to be discovered and experienced. Faith is going to continue into eternity. New things that God is going to tell us and that, that will unfold. Uh, but uh, hope uh, is a, a beautiful character quality. And if you're not a person of hope, then uh, I hope that you would take heart today and say, maybe I need to readjust my thinking. And uh, But hope is personal. So Father, today we, we pray that you would help us. I have a hope today that's beyond myself. It's in you that you're going to speak to my heart and to our hearts by your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the people of Israel were hoping Jewish people were hoping that somebody was going to come and deliver them from their enemies. And they had many enemies through the years, the Philistines, the Midianites, the Babylonians, the Romans that ruled over them. But through it all, they had this hope that went back to their earliest days that someone, someone was going to arise. Their hope was not just that things are going to change. Their hope was that someone is going to come and show up and change things. The Messiah, the anointed one, uh, was a word that came to describe him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Isaiah 40, uh, or 61, I guess it is, wherever it's at. Anyhow, it says, a prophecy of Jesus, the words, first words he spoke in the congregation of his hometown in Nazareth when he went in there and said, the, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach deliverance and recovery and healing. And uh, that was a huge thing. They took him out to kill him because that was, how could that be? From our own hometown, the local boy, he says, I'm the one that we've been hoping in all these years. No way it could be. But it was true. And Jesus just uh, went on his way and left them to wonder where he'd gone because it wasn't time for him to die yet. But, uh, but uh, hope is wrapped up in a person. I want us to look at it in terms of the Bible prophecies and also in terms of our own lives. What is our hope in? Is it in something, some circumstance, or is it in a person who is going to bring forth his glory in our lives and around about us? So not just the Romans were going to be thrown off and the Midianites, but there was a hope that someone was going to rise that was going to throw them off. Micah 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem of Freda, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. And the wise men came to Herod and asked, you know, who's, where is he that's born the king of the Jews? Where is he going to be born? They found out, the, uh, the uh, scholars and scribes said, well, it's going to be in Bethlehem, which 
which is about five miles away from Jerusalem. So they headed over there. And of course, Herod headed over there with his soldiers to kill all the babies that would have been within that age range. But there was one person. It was not just a general political uprising or something. There was one person they were looking for. Hope is personal. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. See, it was all wrapped up in a person. They were looking for somebody who was going to come, the promised one, the Messiah. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. No wonder they were excited when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, on the triumphal entry. They thought, this is it. The increase of his government and peace is going to begin now. And the, they didn't understand they had a hope of that, but there was a better hope that they needed to discover, and that was that they were going to be saved from their sins. They were going to be delivered from all the regulations and rules of animal sacrifice and everything else that was going to be fulfilled in Jesus. That's better than getting rid of the Romans uh, and that he would write his law in their hearts. And there was going to be a new covenant. It's hard to give up something after you've honored it and practiced it for 1,500 years. That's about how long the, the, from Mount Sinai and the giving of the Ten Commandments and the other laws and rules, they had honored and revered. It's hard to let go of that hope. I want to talk today about the fact it's hard for us to let go of our hopes. We have so much wrapped up in them, we don't believe there could be a better hope because it's going to cause us pain if, if we don't see the things happen that we had desired to happen. But just to, to reinforce that hope is personal. It's about a person, not just a a movement or something happening on a general scale, but it's all wrapped up in a person. Our hope needs to be wrapped up in a person today, not wrapped up in this happening or that happening, but our hope is in Jesus, that he has a plan, that he is good, that he is great, and that he cares about us. There was a man named Simeon, we read Luke 2.25. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. The consolation of Israel, the Greek word there is, is paraclete, which is the same word as the Holy Spirit, another comforter. The comforter is one that's called alongside, two words which mean help and alongside. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. That means he was waiting for the Messiah to come that was going to help them, was going to come alongside. And uh, Jesus was brought to the temple by Mary and Joseph that day, and he spoke to them. He took the child in his arms, and he prophesied in verse 34. He blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And he talked more, which we won't go into, but, but he held a little baby in his arms, said, This is the hope of Israel. This is the consolation of Israel. This is the Messiah. All our hopes are wrapped up in this child. Uh, there was a woman that Jesus talked to in the city of Samaria, a Samaritan woman. And they had got off track from the Jews when they were carried away captive. And some came back and they mixed their religion with local religions. The Samaritans were despised by the Jews because of that. But at least they had this in common. They both believed that there was a Messiah coming. And Jesus talking to this woman about things and uh, in her own personal life and began to get a little bit uncomfortable. You know, you've had uh, five husbands and the one you're living right with right now is not your husband. And sir, I perceive you're a prophet, but let's talk about something else instead of me. You know, when the Messiah comes, he's going uh, to tell us all things. John 4, 25. She knew that there was somebody it was coming. They were looking for a person. And Jesus right out that says, well, I am he. Don't just wait for it to happen off in the 
future. Not someday your prince will come, but I am here at this well talking to you. Uh, and uh, all, you know, you're thirsty. I'm going to give you living water. It's not going to run dry. You come to this well and you go away and you get thirsty again. You come back, but I am, I am the water of life. I'm, a, I'm the well. It's, our hope is, her hope was not just that this man was going to, going to give her a drink of water from a well or give her some little bit of wisdom, but that he was going to change her life, that he was going to give her hope. A woman that was looked down on, probably the reason she was there in the middle of the day because the other ladies, when they came, would make fun of her, uh, look down their nose at her. But uh, Jesus gave her hope, and he was hope. She said, she went back to the village. She didn't say, well, come out here. I want you to hear some teaching. She said, no, I want you to come and meet a man. That is what you need to meet Jesus. Our hope is in him. Not in that we have everything figured out spiritually, understand the Bible completely, that we figured out how to live our lives and all that. Our hope is in Jesus, that he is a God that's merciful, that cares, that is reaching out. He went out of his way on that day to go through Samaria, which was unusual for a Jewish person to do. But he knew there was a woman there that needed him and and she found hope. John 1. Verse 45, the, the disciples of Jesus that are described their calling here, but Philip was one that came and encountered Jesus. He wasn't just impressed by his teaching uh, and knowledge. You know, in the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says the people were amazed because he spoke to them not as the scribes and the Pharisees, but one that had authority, something different about him. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, didn't say we just found some new philosophy. He said, we found a person. Here's his name. Here's his dad's name. This is the one that Moses and the prophets foretold that there would be this one that would rise up. And we have found him that, you know, Nathaniel would have thought, are you, is this too good to be true? How could it be? You know, a little guy like me here and uh, no importance to anybody else. And, and, uh, and now he shows up on the scene and uh, Philip says, come and find him. Philip was one that brought others to Jesus. Uh, but we, you know, we don't have to have everything figured out on, in order to witness to other people. We don't need to have all the answers to the difficult questions problems of pain and suffering and everything else, uh, the end time prophecies and what does this mean and that mean. What we need to do is to be in contact with Jesus in relationship with him. And then we say, come and meet a person that is in, I've encountered that has touched my life, that has given me hope, that has given me direction. So John 6, verse 67, Jesus was teaching on difficult things, you know, eat my flesh and drink my blood, or you can't be my disciple. And uh, there was a spiritual aspect there, but still the, the poor disciples, they're thinking, what in the world? And, and many people that had been following him departed, say, that's just too weird. I don't understand that. Uh, and so in John six sixty seven, Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. He said, I haven't got things figured out theologically, and I don't know even what a clue what you were saying when you were telling those people those things. I haven't got that rationally, intellectually all sorted out in my mind, but I know you. And I, where else? He didn't say Where else shall we go? To what other teaching shall we go? He said, to whom shall we go? And I ask you, to whom are you going to go? If you turn away from Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. Peter said, we have have believed, we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. To whom else are you going to go? Adam and Eve in the garden have sinned. To whom else are they going to (laughs) go? Back to Satan, uh, not hardly. 
They didn't know where to go, and so they ran away. But Jesus came, God the Father came looking for them. Adam, where are you? Get back here. I'm going to make a covering for you. When we have sinned, we're, to whom else shall we go? To ourselves, to our own doing more good deeds to outweigh the bad, to some other religion that will give us some way to work our way back into his good grace? No, go directly to him, to you. That's where we need to go. David and Bathsheba, the scandal that happened there, and the child that was conceived was lying there dying. Second Samuel twelve sixteen. Therefore David sought God on behalf of the child. He wanted an outcome. He had a hope that maybe God would heal that baby that was born of their sin and that God had, had uh, pronounced a judgment, a consequence of that, that the child was going to die. But David still had a hope in God, in spite of what he'd done, uh, that maybe that baby could live. I say, you know, until God tells us, quit praying, let's keep praying, keep hoping. Our hope is not in that outcome itself so much as in that there's a God that cares, a God that's merciful and gracious. David fasted. He went in and lay all night on the ground. He didn't go to the temple of Dagon or Baal. He didn't go to the tavern. Uh, it says in, uh, in verse 20, Then David arose from the earth after he found out that the child had died. Then he arose from the earth, washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. Where do you go? When you're in a situation where you failed, where things have fallen apart. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then he went to his own house. And when he was asked, they set food before him and he ate. Because his hope was not in a circumstance only. His hope was not that that child is going to live. Therefore, that's, that's my hope. His hope was in, in God. He wrote Psalm 51 probably around this same time. Verse 10, this was his hope. Create in me a clean heart, O God. He didn't say, God, bring that little baby back from the dead or don't let it die. His hope was, God, that you would create in me a clean heart. That's the hope that's based on a person and, and a relationship with him. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. How many times have I prayed that prayer? I've memorized whole Psalm 51. I probably quote it more than any other chapter in the Bible. Uh, and uh, just a piece here and there many times. But I love this part. He had a hope that God, in spite of he had committed adultery, had the the husband killed, uh, had been, you know, at least nine months if the child was born after the conception to, to think over what he'd done and to, uh, con, you know, condemn himself and, and wrong, rightfully feel the shame and the guilt of that. But, but he had a hope, God, that you would create in me a clean heart. I have a hope that you'd renew a right spirit in me. And his great hope, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. He had a, a better hope. You'd better hope when you're in a situation like that, but you better have a better hope. And just that things are going to work out in the natural realm, or your better hope is that God is not going to cast you away from his presence, that he's not going to take his Holy Spirit from you. David saw what happened when the Spirit of the Lord, the Bible says, departed from Saul, and he went off the deep end. Uh, insane, literally, clinically, uh, mentally ill in, a, in dangerous ways, killing people. And, and uh, just, it's a whole sad story. But, but David said, God, I hope that you don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. That's my great hope. Don't cast me away from your presence. Job was in dire straits. He lost everything. He's Kids had been killed, all his possessions and gone, and he was physically in, in t terrible shape, boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Where do you go when it seems like God has turned against you? <laughs> uh, he said in verse 10 of Job 19, He breaks me down on every side. I am gone, and my hope he has pulled out like a tree. Uh, talking about hope today, and, and Job's hope, of things changing in his natural life were gone. He thought, it's over. 
my relatives have failed me, verse 14, and my close friends have forgotten me. But he still had a hope in spite of that that was beyond the things happening here on this earth. The situation changes. He had this hope in verse 25 of that same chapter. But I know, after saying all these other things are going wrong, but I know that my Redeemer lives. At the last, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Sitting there covered in boils, forsaken by everyone and everything that he had owned was gone. All that was dear to him was, had perished uh, other than his wife who was telling him to curse God and die. But he said, I still know something. In spite of all this, I have a better hope than that those things are going to be reversed. I know that my Redeemer lives. I'm going to see Him. I'm, after my skin has been destroyed, after the boils have done their job, and whatever is left of me yet, in my flesh I shall see God. One of the greatest uh, declarations in the Old Testament of the resurrection and life after death. Uh, the Bible says... Uh, and I uh, think I've, I've got it. Well, we'll come to that a little bit later. But, uh, but if your hope is only in this life, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to want to give up. You need a better hope. That's what we talked about. Hebrews seven nineteen was what we looked at last week. The law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. That raised all kinds of hackles on the backs and necks of the Pharisees when there's some new covenant, some better way than what we have. You know, we've got it down to a science. We've got God in this box and we know exactly how to treat him and handle him and everybody else. Well, Jesus came to introduce a better hope even than the animal sacrifices and the laws of, of Moses. Uh, and God brings a better hope to us. My, uh, you know, just on a practical level, we, we have hopes and dreams for our, our, our lives, our relationships, our careers, our health, uh, and finances and everything else. I didn't probably consciously think too much about it, but I, I just hope that when I grew up, my brother Dave and I would be able to enjoy life together. He would be 65 right now. I'm 67. But at age 16, he was killed in a car accident. And any hopes that I had of that happening were gone. I tell people at, uh, at funerals, memorial services, many times say, this is the death of hope. That person laying in the coffin there, they're not going to rise again. Your death of hopes, plural, I should say, not death of hope. Our hopes for many things are not going to come and be fulfilled. We all live with unfulfilled desires, dreams, and hopes that are never going to happen. The specific things. But I tell people, from my own experience, that's not the death of hope. It's the death of hopes that I had for that relationship and what was going to happen. But uh, out of my brother's death, there came a, a, an awakening in my heart, in our town, Dan was talking about going to, to Warm Beach Camp, the World Map Missionary Assistance Plans this morning. It mentioned Walt and Paula being there. Well, Don and Gloria were there too, and they can attest to what I'm saying today. There was a, an awakening that took place in our town. People that, are, that were the least likely to become Christians, the least likely to become Assembly of God pastors in a couple of cases. Uh, when my brother passed away, that was the death of my hopes for that, for my relationship with him. And I, you know, I still, uh, 49 years later, I could, I could still um, grieve over it. And, and nothing wrong with that. There are things that we have to grieve that we say, well, it's just not going to happen. Things did not work out the way that I wish they would. Those hopes are gone, but hope itself is not gone. I wouldn't be a pastor today if that hadn't happened. Uh, I, I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not just in the hope of an easy life without any difficulties or, or hard things. But 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of, of all people most to be pitied. You know, I've, 
I think it's great to live the Christian life. And I've wondered about that verse because I think that's the healthiest, happiest way to live. Living according to the direction of God in a way that will bring fulfillment. Why does it say we are the most to be pitied? You know, you sorrowful person, you poor person. (laughs) Because if in this life only we have hope, it's in the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. I think the reason that is is because we serve a God that's great, a God that's good. And how can it be that there are so many difficulties? We've prayed for people this morning that are in such, uh, such circumstances. You just wonder, how could there be a God that would allow them to go through that? And we look at the suffering and, and pain in the world. Well, if this life was all there was, then we'd be pretty bad off because we believe in a God that's great and good. And these things are happening. Well, the first part of that says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, then we are of all most people most to be pitied. We have a hope that's not just in this life. We have a better hope than things working out. And and, uh, someday, someday we'll see. They sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, the book of Revelation says, saying, great, marvelous are thy works, O God Almighty, who shall not fear thee? King of saints, uh, and fall down and worship before you. Why? Because your judgments are made manifest. Someday we're going to see. We're not going to say, God, you really messed up there. Too bad you didn't have the insight that I have, because I would have had you do things different. No, someday we're going to see. So the things, whatever we're going through, the tragedies, the traumas, uh, if in this life only we have hope, we are, of all people, to be pitied. Most miserable, King James says. Thank you.